Okay, we are live. Audio and video is up. The lecture notes are up. Welcome to Statics. Um, so let me give a couple of quick announcements. Um, first off, uh, I want to be crystal clear because um, there was a question at the beginning of class. I want to make sure that everybody is aware that exam three is on November 18th. Okay, uh, we are going to have our exam review on November 16th. Uh, and we are having the exam on the 18th and on the 20th, right before Thanksgiving break. I'm canceling class, okay? So exam is on the 18th, right? So I just want to make sure everybody's clear on that. Okay, let's talk about Friday. Um, uh, here's what I decided to do, because I'm sure that you all are uh, uh, aware or saw the message that Marshall is, um, is sort of instituting a little bit of a break, uh, a mental health day on Friday. And so what I'm going to do is um, on... Uh, Somebody pointing on the screen. Oh, is that an error? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's what happens when you copy and paste. I see somebody pointing on the screen. So, so yeah. That, that. Sorry about that. So here are all. Yeah. So this this should be uh, Wednesday. That should be Friday. Sorry about that. Okay. So uh, here here's what we're going to do with um, uh, lecture today. We're going to introduce the concept of a truss analysis. Uh, we're going to do the method of joints, uh, and that you'll understand what that means uh, here in a little bit. Um, on Friday, see the thing with the method of joints. The method of joints, as you'll see, is a uh, a more versatile method. Um, you can solve the entire structure. Um, and uh, what I was going to do on Friday, as a result, is I was just going to do another example. Um, and so this is actually sort of a perfect. Uh, uh, topic to pre-record. So what I'm going to do is we're going to, you know, sort of hit the ground running with trusses today. We're going to get as far as we can. And then on Friday, what I'll, uh, what I'll probably do is I'm just going to record an additional example, um, one that's maybe a bit more intricate. Uh, and then you can watch that on your own and and, uh, uh, and do the homework, which is going to be due on Monday. I'm not going to have the homework due on Friday. So I am, I'm going to try and do my best to respect this, uh, this initiative that Marshall's doing to try and give everybody a break. Uh, 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 sort of a reset day uh, on Friday. You'll still have a homework due Monday, but you'll have a, a, a little bit of a break. Okay, everybody good on the schedule, on the logistics, any questions? So we're not going to meet live on Friday. I'm just going to pre-record a video, post it to the YouTube playlist, and um, uh, you all can watch that on your own, and, and we'll meet again on Monday. Any questions? I'm going to take that as a no. Let's continue in the world of statics. We're going to talk about trusses today. Um, so let me sort of let, let's let's look at this a, a little bit larger view. Let's talk about the course. Let's talk about what we've been doing in here and you know how we're, we're tying everything up. This course is really about two things. Um, it's about forces and moments. Um, if if you could. If you could define what statics is about to somebody in as succinct a phrase as possible, that, that'd probably be it. But what, we're, what we've been doing near the end of the course is taking forces and moments and applying them to very specific problems or classes of problems that engineers face. And so the first one that we dealt with was centroids. And so we were using the concept of you know, weights and then moments of those weights in order to define what a center of gravity was and then generalize that to the this concept of a centroid. And so that was sort of the first application of statics to a problem that engineers uh, face regularly. The uh, a prospect of performing a truss analysis is also a very common problem that engineers face, specifically civil engineers. This is one of the most uh, 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 foundational challenges that civil engineers face. It's like, it, regardless of where where you go to school, regardless of, of uh, you know what courses you take and 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 whatnot, when I meet somebody on the street and and they have a bachelor of science in civil engineering or, or have a degree in that field, 
there's some things that, that I expect them to do or be able to do, and one of them is solving a trust. Uh, that's just sort of a, a foundational uh, challenge. Um, so let's talk about trusses. And so what do I mean by trusses? I'm sure that everybody in here has seen a trust before, um, but if you want a, a formal definition, a truss is a, an arrangement of straight members, typically in triangular patterns to form a structure or, or a component of a structure. And so what I mean by a component of a structure or a structure, it could be a bridge, it could be roof trusses in a roof system in a building. Um, anytime that you ever see a triangular arrangement of members, um, that, that's typically going to be uh, assessed as a truss or, or using some type of a uh, truss analogy. Trusses are very, very common in structural engineering applications. They're lightweight. Um, so if you look at, let's say, the bridge uh, image, I can tell you that that bridge is lighter than if you were to uh, design a comparable bridge using just like beams. Like those beams would probably be a lot heavier for the, uh, the same load demand. Um, there are some, they're also stiffer, uh, and what I mean by stiffness is if you take a truss and you apply load to it, uh, it results by deforming, it, it, it undergoes a deformation. Now this is statics, and so we're assuming everything is a rigid body, so for us, you know, the, all the deformations are zero, uh, but that doesn't happen in real life. In real life, you take a structure, you put load on it, it deforms. Trusses tend to deform a lot less than their flexion counterparts. Um, some of the downsides of trusses is that they can be expensive. You know, they're, they're a lot more members, there's a lot more to fabricate, a lot more connections to build, it takes a little bit longer to construct them. So there's trade-offs in, in the world of engineering as to when you would use one system versus another. So it's something you, you need to be aware of. Now, um, one of the, the nice things about uh, dealing with this topic right after centroids is looking, when we look at the assumptions uh, uh, for centroids, we can actually or, sorry, when we look at uh, the assumptions that we use when analyzing trusses, the, the concept of a centroid actually you know, plays right into it. So when we analyze trusses, we make the following three assumptions. Really, these three assumptions result in one conclusion about the internal forces in a member, but it's really based on these, these assumptions. Okay, so number one, we assume that all of the members are connected by frictionless joints, okay? So we're not really trying to account for any like friction or differential forces among members. We're trying to keep it simple. So that's kind of the, the spirit of assumption number one. Assumption number two is that all of the loads, all of the support reactions, any of the forces are applied directly at the joints. And by joints, what I mean is the points on the structure where all of the members meet. So, you know, for instance, if I have, you know, let's say here's a truss, um, you know, let's say here's a truss and I've got this and this and this, and maybe it goes like that. I'm just making this up. Um, and let's say, you know, I have a boundary condition here and a boundary condition here. When I say joints, I'm talking about these points that I'm filling in right here, the points where the members meet. We have a name for that. We call those joints. Okay. So what we're assuming is we're assuming that there's no friction uh, anywhere uh, in the structure. So we don't need to deal with any, you know, additional unintended forces. All of the loads that are on the system are applied directly at the joints. So they're, they're, we don't have any loads on the members. They're always on the joints. But this, this third one is something that I think everybody can now uh, uh, get along with, and that's that at each joint, the centroidal axes of each member coincide. And so that's just really fancy way of saying that if you look at a truss joint, and, and we actually fabricate trusses in real life to behave this way. So I have a picture of a, of a real life truss joint uh, out in the field. So like, let's say you're looking at like that member. Okay, I would imagine that the centroid is probably like right there, you know, so like where, you know, where along the member would the centroid be? So let's say it's kind of like in the middle, like this member, it's probably going to be in the middle, this member, it's going to be in the middle, this member, this member. And if you follow these points, what you'll find is that all of them meet at a common place. They all meet at a common place. Okay, in steel fabrication land, we call that the work point, but uh, just just for, for uh, terminology's sake. But we do that on purpose, okay? And the reason why we do that is that if you have all of the members 
and all of their centroids all meet at a common point. And you place the load on that point. What that means is, is that at that joint, there is no moment, okay? That's, that's the whole point behind these assumptions. So if all the centroids meet, you put the load at the joint, and there's no in, unintended uh, uh, forces from like friction or anything like that, then there's no moment. So whenever you're looking at the joints, you're almost like going back to chapter two, and it becomes a, a, a concurrent force system where all the forces all meet at a common point, okay? So it, you know, in real life, uh, it substantially reduces the shear and the moment that you can have at the connection. We'll talk about shears and moments uh, not too long from now. That'll be something we delve into next week uh, when we look at shear and moment diagrams. And so the big kicker or the big thing to keep in mind when you're looking at a, at a truss is that whenever you're looking at the internal forces inside a truss member, you can assume that only axial load is present. So for instance, you know, I have here my little, uh, this is my little rubber beam, you know, mock up here. And so, you know, there's a number of ways I can, you know, apply load to the system. I can take it and I can bend it, you know, so this would be moment, this would be bending uh, that you would find inside the section. I can take it and I can shear it, right? So shearing would be like if I was ripping this like it was a piece of paper. I can take it, and I can rip it like that, or I can rip it like that. That would be shearing, okay? So if you look at uh, typical uh, beams that you find in buildings and bridges, what ends up happening is that uh, the beams tend to experience a lot of bending in the middle and a lot of shear near the ends. And so that becomes a, a foundation for how we design these things uh, in the real world. But with trusses, we, we look at basically one of the other ways we can load it, which is axially. In other words, we're either yanking on it, like trying to stretch it like it was a piece of taffy, so that's tension, so yanking on it in tension, or we're pushing on it in compression. So imagine if it was sort of like a column in a, in a building, and I'm pushing down on it, right? So it's either loaded in tension or compression. And in, in analytical terms, we treat tension and compression sort of the same. It's just really a sign convention, you know? So for instance, I might yank on it, you know, pull it in tension with a positive, I don't know, 50 pounds, and then I might push on it in compression, and that I might consider that as negative 50 pounds. So they're, they're really sort of the same force along that same axis, right? Going back to, you know, the line of action of a force. It's a single force on a line of action. The question, uh, the question is whether or not the force is acting in a tensile fashion or a compressive fashion. Now, um, so ultimately when we're looking at a truss, so let's say I've got this truss here, you know, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the slide. When I say solve a truss, what I'm really interested in is determining the internal forces inside each of those members. So to give you kind of an idea, maybe, you know, I don't know, um, let's put some, I don't know, let's put some numbers here. Let's say that this member is experiencing, I don't know, 60 pounds and it's in compression, or this member is experiencing 85 pounds and it's in tension or something like that. That's ultimately what we're trying to do when we solve a truss is we're trying to determine all of those internal forces inside the member. And I've got to believe that you see that there's a real world aspect uh, to that because like, why would we be interested in that? Uh, hey, the, the, the member's experiencing 60 pounds in compression, you know, who cares? Well, the, the answer is in design. Like if I, if I understand that that member is experiencing 60 pounds in compression, I then can determine, well, how big does that member need to be so that it safely resists this load? So there's a very real world uh, application of what we're talking about here. So, so how do you go about doing that? How do you go about taking this triangular arrangement of members and resolving it into a series of internal forces? Like, how do I get those? Well, there's really two approaches, okay? The first approach is the method of joints, okay? And in that approach, basically what we do is we look at the equilibrium of each joint one at a time. It is a bit tedious, especially if you have a really, really big truss, uh, but it's thorough. The nice thing about the method of joints is that it's systematic, and then when it's all said and done, you've got the entire truss solved for. Uh, the other approach is what's called the method of sections, and we'll look at the method of sections next week. But in the method of sections, instead of solving each truss uh, or each uh, joint uh, one at a time, 
what we're doing is we're basically cutting the, the, the trust using a section. I might have mentioned, you know, a long time ago that one of the secret weapons of structural engineering is the samurai sword or a lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan. The idea is, you know, we take the trust and we separate it uh, by cutting a section, an imaginary line through, you know, a certain portion of it. Uh, and the idea is, okay, what are the forces along that section or inside the, the members along that section in order to maintain equilibrium? But the upside to the method of sections is that it allows you to solve for a particular member really quickly. Like if you have a really, really big trust and you want the force in one of the members inside the trust, then you can do that very quickly. The downside is that it doesn't really work too well when you're trying to solve the entire trust. If you're trying to solve the entire trust, which is very common you know, among engineers, then you need to uh, you need to use the, uh, the the method of joints. So let today we're going to focus on the method of joints. Let's talk about the method of joints. So the method of joints. What we're doing is we're looking at the equations of equilibrium for each joint. Okay. So if I look at this joint, I want to go back to you know a discussion that we had in chapter two. In chapter two, we were looking at static of particles, and if you remember. Um, you know, when we started introducing moments and, and rigid bodies, uh, equilibrium, and all that stuff, um, the, the issue with the, you know, that moments was trying to resolve is what if the forces don't meet at a common point? Well, with trusses, and you're, when you're looking at the joint, that's not the case. Whenever you're solving a truss, all of the forces do meet at a common point. So whenever you're looking at the equilibrium of a joint, you only have two equations of equilibrium that you need to, to, to deal with. If this was a space truss, if we were looking in three dimensions, then every joint would have three equations of equilibrium. Um, and so whenever you're uh, plotting out your strategy for solving a truss, whenever you're looking at a joint, you can only solve joints where there are, are at most two unknown member forces. And that'll become clear as we uh, as we, we begin, uh, begin our example problem. Um, and so, you know, You'll, you'll, you'll have to be a bit strategic in how you plan out a, a given problem. But as you go through this, I think you'll find that trust analysis is a very systematic and very straightforward process. There's a couple detail-oriented things you kind of need to watch out for, but by and large, it's really not very, uh, very difficult. So let's look at a, an example. So this is a, a, a somewhat short example, but the idea is I wanted to come up with something that's manageable in the time frame, and we're going to take our time uh, with this. We're going to determine the internal member forces of this truss using the method of joint. Okay. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to determine the support reactions. Um, so that'll be kind of a refresher of some stuff that we did uh, in chapter four. Uh, and then we'll take each joint one at a time and see if we can solve the, the entire structure. Okay. So I'm going to um, stop the share. Let me bring up the uh, notebook. Okay, so here's our, our truss here. Um, and so the first thing that we need to do is we need to start defining uh, some, uh, some of our unknown support reactions. So let's look at, uh, at, each, of these, um, uh, at each of these supports. So I have a support at E. And if you look, E is a roller. So remind me with rollers, how many unknown support reactions do we have with a roller? So we're looking at that point right there. One, exactly right. So, uh, so I'll I'll draw that vertically, and let's come up with a name for that. Let's call that E Y. Okay. Now, what about point C? How many support reactions are we going to have there? There we go. Two. So we've got. Uh, I'll I'll draw an upward force right there. We'll call this C Y, and then I've got this force here. We'll call this CX. Okay, now let's look at this from a strategy standpoint. Um, we have three equations of equilibrium. So, so right now we're trying to determine the support reactions. So let's write that down, uh, support reactions. Okay, so what's an observation that somebody in the chat can help me out with right now? You really don't need to do any math to determine one of these reactions immediately. I want to see if anybody sees it. Remember, 
for support reactions, we have the sum of the forces in the x direction, the sum of the forces in the y direction, and the sum of the moments about any arbitrary point. Those are our three equations that we have to deal with. So can anybody look at this truss and see one that's really easy? There you go. That's what I wanted to see. If I sum forces in the x direction, look at the structure. There's nothing applied horizontally. Like what we have, we've got 2,000 pounds. That's vertical. That's vertical. That's vertical. That's vertical. So the only thing that's uh, horizontal is Cx. The so Cx is zero. That one's easy, okay? That's pretty good. Now, as for the other two, the CY and the EY, um, we can apply the sum of the forces in the vertical, like we can apply the sum of the forces in the Y direction, but that's not gonna really tell us anything right now. We're gonna know that CY is going up, EY is going up, and I've got, what, one and 2,000, I got 3,000 going down. So it's not gonna allow me to solve for a particular, um, a particular uh, uh, um, uh, reaction. Remember that that's that's where the sum of the moments comes into play. So I propose we need to sum moments first. Okay. Now it doesn't really matter where we sum moments. Um, I think that we should sum moments though about where one of our reactions goes through. So we'll we'll let chat figure this out. You want me to sum moments at C or do you want me to sum moments at E? Doesn't really matter either way. While you're doing that, let me get my calculator out. E. All right. We'll sum moments at E. And we got to pick a sign convention. We'll take counterclockwise moments to be positive. So we take this one step at a time. So let's just do each one of these. So let's start off with the 2,000 pounds. So we have 2,000 pounds, right? Um, if I look at point E, that causes rotation that's positive because it's you know counterclockwise at about point E. And what's my moment arm from E? I want to make sure chat's involved today. What's my moment arm for that 2,000 pounds going to be from E? There you go. 18 feet. That perpendicular distance. That's what I want to see. All right, good. All right, so the next one, we've got the 1,000 pounds. The 1,000 pounds is, again, going to generate a counterclockwise rotation, so that's positive. 1,000 pounds. And what's my moment arm for this one going to be? There you go, six feet. Um, we've got the CY. The CY is going to, let's see, uh, CY looks like it is also generating a rotation going this direction. So plus CY uh, times a moment arm. I think that's also six feet. I'll just uh, you know walk us through there. So the, here's our, our uh, equation. So what do we got? We've got 2,000 times 18. Uh, that's what, 36,000 foot pounds plus 6,000 foot pounds plus CY times six feet is zero. So 36 plus six is 42. Is negative CY times six feet. So therefore, CY is, was that negative 7,000? So ultimately what that means is that I assumed the incorrect direction, which is completely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. CY is 7,000 pounds, uh, and that's acting downwards. That's okay. You can always assume an incorrect direction. If you get a negative answer, there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm going to talk a lot about that today, about, you know, the direction in which you assume a, uh, uh, the direction in which you assume a, a force to act. And if it's negative, you, you get a, a, a different answer. So you know, th that's okay. Um, everybody okay with this so far? Any questions? We have one more, uh, 
with one more uh, uh, equation of equilibrium. That's the sum of the forces in the y direction. Okay, so the sum of the forces in the y direction. So we have, let's see, we've got negative 2,000 pounds minus 1,000 pounds. We've got um, positive EY. And then the CY, we know the CY is going down. It's uh, negative, it's 7,000 pounds down. So I'm just going to write 7,000 pounds down, negative. And so what is that? 2,000, 1,000, 7,000, that's 10,000. So EY is 10,000 pounds up. Okay. Now that should be a review. That should be. You know, old hat at this point. Um, any questions? Oh, sorry. We'll make sure everybody's good on this. Be good. All right. Again, don't don't hesitate if you got any questions because um, we're gonna take you know this this concept of the reactions and run with it. So I really want to make sure that this is uh, this is clear. Okay. All right. So let's talk about um, uh, uh, solving this truss. Okay. So we've got our support reactions figured out, and maybe I'll I'll go ahead and just you know place them on the truss. Just to make sure that you know we we have this you know that we're clear on what's going on. So um, let's see this. Oh, this is we found that that one was seven thousand pounds, and we found that this one was ten thousand pounds. And there was a horizontal reaction there, so that's zero. So I'm just I'm not going to bother drawing it. Okay. Um, the first thing that we need to do uh, in order to solve uh, a truss is we need to select a joint where there's at most two unknowns, okay? And so what I mean by that is we couldn't start at joint B, okay? So when I say unknowns, I mean each of these members. Like nobody here knows what the internal force in like that member is, for example, or really any of the members in the truss, that's the whole point. Now, joint B, how many members does joint B have framing into it? It has one, two, three, four members framing into it, right? So one, two, three, four. So we could not so start our truss analysis at joint B, okay? We can't start it at joint B because too many unknowns. We only have two equations of equilibrium, a sum of forces in the X direction and a sum of forces in the Y direction when we look at each joint, okay? So we got we got to sort of you know uh, uh, work with that. So I'm looking at this truss and I'm seeing only two joints that we could start with. I want chat to help me out. What are those two joints that we could start with? A and C. Okay. So A and C. Mr. Page is exactly right. I'm going to ask chat for help on this. Uh, uh, which one you want me to do? It doesn't matter. We can do either one. Whoever gets the picks first. C. All right. That's what we're doing. Okay. All right. Um, let's look at joint C. Okay. So we'll do a joint C. So I sort of do joint C and I'll sort of label it like that. Okay. So the first thing that we'll do, let's place our, you know, sort of a symbol for our joint. That's our joint out here in space. Um, First thing I like to do is I like to draw the members, okay? So I have a member that sort of goes like that, and I have a member that sort of goes like that, okay? Now, one of the things that we're going to talk about is the slope ratio of that member, because you can see that that member is on a 6 to 8 slope ratio. I don't know, can, can you see that from the, from the diagram? Let me write that. A little clearer a six to eight slope ratio all right um so so there's that next thing we got to do is we have to ask ourselves are there any loads applied directly to the joint and the answer is yes okay 
we have a downward load at 7,000 pounds. And that downward load, that 7,000 pounds is the reaction, the reaction at C that we solved for earlier. That's why we needed the reactions first. Okay. Now what we have to do is we have to ask ourselves, what are our unknowns? Okay. Now I propose that there are two unknowns in this joint, namely the forces inside those members. Okay. So we can label this however we want. Um, maybe what we'll do is we'll call this um, uh, FBC, and we'll call this one FCE. I, I tend to usually label them alphabetically. Okay. All right. So this would be sort of a description of what our joint looks like and all of the unknowns that go into it. Now, one of the things I'm going to do right off the bat uh, is this, okay? I'm going to sort of redraw this joint. I'm going to draw it a little differently, um, uh, and you'll see, you'll see what I'm doing here in a second. So here's this, here's this, here's this. Um, got my... 7,000 pounds. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this sort of drawn like that. I'm going to call this FBC. But for this diagonal, I'm going to draw this a little differently, okay? See how I've got the force pulling away from the joint, like the FCE is sort of pointing away from it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to split that into an X component and a Y component, okay? And so we'll call this FCE Y and FCE X, okay? And I'll talk about how to draw those forces uh, here in a little bit. Uh, but for the sake of discussion, uh, let's just, you know, hopefully I think we can all agree are all pointing away. Now, one other thing I will mention, uh, if this is eight and this is six, what's the hypotenuse of this triangle going to be? Anybody know that? Can anybody come up with that pretty easily? What's the hypotenuse of that triangle? There we go. One of the things you will find in engineering is a lot of those Pythagorean triples that show up, you know, like three, four, five triangles or eight, 15, 17, five, 12, 13. You'll see a lot of those pop up to try and make uh, your, your life a little easier. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to kind of try and treat this problem and these forces kind of like they're separate. Right. And, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. How many unknown horizontal forces do you see? Well, you should see one and two, right? There's a, the FBC, and then there's this X component of the, the, the diagonal. But for the vertical, there's only one unknown. There's that FCEY. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start off by summing forces in the Y direction. Okay, so let's sum forces in the y direction. And if I look at this joint, what I have is I have 7,000 pounds going down, so that's negative. And then I have FCE, but the y component, and that's also going down. That's negative. Set that equal to zero. Okay. Now, therefore, would you agree that FCE, the Y component of that is 7,000 pounds. Everybody with me so far? Or actually, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, negative 7,000 pounds. Sorry, negative. You're exactly right. Thank you for catching that. 
that's that's an easy thing to uh, uh, to miss. Okay. Now here's um, here's sort of how I'm gonna gonna handle this. Uh, I'm gonna do this the trig way, and then I'll show you sort of a shortcut. Uh, and maybe I'll show you the shortcut in a in, in that uh, video on Friday because I want to make sure that I'm that I'm being systematic here. So whenever I split this up into x and y components, what I'm doing is I'm using that you know tip to tail vector notation that we did in the past. Remember how you could say you know you have a vector here, and then you can attach that to a vector there, and that equals you know if you were to just you know start at the beginning and work your way down so maybe i'll use some solid lines that's so a little easier to see on the recording so f c e y and f c e x that if i use that tip to tail fashion then really you know adding those two up it is just this okay so my point is, if I can define what's going on with this triangle, and I can define that based on my slope ratio up here, then I can determine, if I know the Y component, I can determine the X component, and I can determine the, uh, the diagonal really, really easily. So the way I'll do that is say, maybe I can figure out that angle. How would I determine that? Well. Um, I propose that the tangent of that angle is going to be the same thing as the tangent of this angle. And how do I determine the tangent of that angle? 8 over 6. Okay. Right? Opposite over adjacent, because I'm talking about this angle right there. So therefore, theta is the inverse tangent of 8 over 6, which is, hold on, fifty three point one three degrees. And so I've got that angle, I've got this side, I can start using that to find, you know, other components. So for instance, the tangent of that angle could be also defined as F C E Y over F C E X, right? Y over X. So F C E X is F C E Y tangent theta. And and you're you're gonna see what I'm, I'm making a point by doing it this way, so so bear with me. So that's going to equal uh, what is it? Uh, Seven thousand pounds times the tangent of that angle. What is the tangent of that angle? Like, and and, and I, I want to walk you through just sort of some some logic here. It's a, a, exactly okay. So see. A lot of times, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, it's it's you know that first gut instinct is okay. I've got a triangle. I've got to do an inverse tangent to find the angle. But then I now I'm going to take the tangent. I'm going to be right back where I began. So why find the angle to begin with, right? You can probably just use the comparison of your slope ratios in order to determine those components. And so I'm going to show you sort of a shortcut in in a. a later uh, in that second video on how to make that process a lot smoother. So 7,000 pounds times 8 over 6. Wait, did I, did I do that backwards? I, I did. Um, I did that backwards. Sorry. This is Y. That's X. Sorry, I did that backwards. So this is 7,000 pounds is FCE X times 8 over 6. See, I have a much simpler way of going about this without using the trig, but I kind of want to introduce you to the trig first because it's probably what you're most familiar with. So therefore, FCE X is, so if I take um, 
7,000 divided by 8 over 6, I get 52.50 pounds. Okay. Barring my little typo there with getting my subscripts backwards, is everybody with me sort of how I'm going about this? Okay. Oh, the negative, uh, the the negative seven thousand. I'm getting to that to, to the sign convention here in a second. So, but but I'm just talking about the numerical values. I, don't worry, I'm going to get to the sign convention. I promise. I just want to make sure you're following the numbers. Okay, good. All right. So if I have the y component and I have the x component. Can somebody tell me how it, what's an easy way of finding that? I have to break out your spell checker on that one in the chat. I promise it's not a trick question. There we go. All right, all right. So therefore, FCE is the square root of 7,000 pounds squared plus 5,250 pounds squared. And in terms of the positives and the negatives, it actually doesn't really matter for this calculation because whether it's positive or negative, I'm going to take the number and square it and take the square root. So I could just chug this out. And when you chug this out, you should get an answer of something like 8750. Right. And again, barring signs, maybe I'll go ahead and throw the negative here. I'm, I'm not really trying to get worked up too much about the signs right now because uh, I'm going to go back to the joint and sort of address the, the sign convention here in a second. But is everybody with me so far on this, on, on sort of the computation? This should be pretty easy. Okay. Uh, let's, let's go back to the joint, okay, because I kind of want to make a point uh, about the joint. I'm going to sort of redraw it here. Here's the joint. Here's the joint, okay? I want to think of a little bit of a simpler way of going about this because the other joints I'm going to kind of go through a lot faster and I think you'll see how I do this. Okay, so this is eight, this was six. Okay, so what did I have? I had a 7,000 pound force going down. Okay, well, think about this. I've got a horizontal component here, I've got a vertical and a horizontal, let's just keep this real simple. If I have 7,000 pounds going down, doesn't this have to be 7,000 pounds going up, right? And isn't that kind of indirectly what we did? I mean, if you look up here, we had the FCY drawn downward, right? And then when we had it drawn downward, right, we got a negative answer. That's because the uh, the direction that we assumed was incorrect. It's kind of like reactions. Like you assume a direction, and if you get a negative answer, it just means it's incor uh, the incorrect direction. Doesn't mean the value's wrong, just the direction. So I've got seven thousand pounds going up. Now, what did I find here? Let's talk about this force. Okay. Now we got a magnitude of five two five zero pounds. Okay. Now let's talk about its direction, okay? So let's talk about directions and let's talk about line of action, okay? I propose that if ever you have a line of action, okay, the two, the, the forces, if you take those forces and you split them up into X and Y components, they either do one of two things. They either both point away from the line of action or 
they both point toward the line of action. Because if you take that component and split it up into its X and Y, right, it's going to either both point, you know, away or both point toward. So this has to go that way, right? Now, if that's the case, What's going to be? Somebody look at the joint and tell me what is that magnitude going to be? I got 7,000 going up. I got 7,000 going down. If I have 5,250 going to the right, what's that value? Exactly. Exactly right. Okay. So you're going to like what we're going to do here in a second. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I what I just showed you is the really complicated way of doing a joint analysis. Now let me show you the really easy way. All right. Let's look at joint A. Okay, because I want to do a different joint, and I kind of want to start from uh, start with looking at a joint that's a little simpler. Okay, let's look at joint A. All right. So here's joint A. Uh, what do we know about joint A? We have a horizontal member that frames into joint A. We have a diagonal member that frames into joint A. Okay? It's also at an eight to six slope ratio. What do we know about the, the load applied on joint A? Well, we know there's a 2,000 pound load being applied vertically to joint A. So if I look at this from an unknown's perspective, I have a horizontal unknown right here and I've got a horizontal and vertical unknown right here. And so I think I got two unknowns in the horizontal, one unknown in the vertical. So I'm going to make this real simple. Okay. I got 2,000 going down. That's got to be 2,000 going up. Okay. And there's my, first, there's my step one. Step two. Whenever I know the vertical component, I can determine the horizontal component. All right. I, they both have to be pointing toward. They're either both pointing toward or they're both pointing away. Since the first one's pointing toward, I know the second one's pointing toward. Hence why I've got that drawn uh, to the left. All right. What about uh, magnitude? Well, here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to take 2,000 pounds. And I'm going to multiply it by a fraction, right? Now, what is that fraction going to be? Well, the fraction is going to come from there, okay? And there's a really simple way of figuring this out. See how the horizontal number is smaller? Like the 6 is smaller than the 8? Multiply it by 6 eighths. Why am I multiplying it by 6 eighths? Because I'm solving for the horizontal component. And so I multiply it by, by 6 eighths because what is 6 eighths? 6 eighths is basically my trig function, right? What did I do up here? Up here, I divided by 8 6. What is dividing by 8 6? It's multiplying by 6 eighths. So 2,000 times 6 eighths is 1,500. And if that's 1,500, this has to be 1,500. That one's going to the left. That one's going to the right. Boom. The truss is solved. This is the formal trig approach. This is me just looking at it. A lot easier, right? Any questions on this? And then I'm here's what I'm going to do. I want to make a conclusion about... You know, my, my answers from these joints about the, the final forces, the, the tension and compression, but I want to make sure you're clear with what I'm doing right now. How did you know the directions again? Okay, so here's the joint. Here's the load. Okay, now I have a, a, a horizontal and vertical component, okay? So I'm saying that because that force has to lie on that line of action, 
that there's only two options, right? They either both point away or they both point towards, okay? Because both of those components have to lie on that line of action. Now, because I've got a 2,000 pound load going down, I'm saying that this has to be 2,000 pounds going up because of vertical equilibrium. Like if I got 2,000 down, I got 2,000 up. And if I got 2,000 up, if this is going up, then that's going that way. You see what I mean? That, that's a great question. That's, that's the, the real point I, I wanted to bring, bring out. And here's what I think I'm going to do, because I know we're running short on time. What I want to do is I really want to dig into this example. So what I'll do is I will take this example and I'll continue with it. And I think you're going to find, if you understand what I just did today, like during this lecture, the rest of this trust is going to be very, very easy. Okay, very easy. Uh, and so I'm actually going to finish it and knock it out. I'll do that on, a, on the, this separate recording. And like I said, we're going to cancel class on Friday. Uh, you all have a homework on Monday. But this supplemental video, it'll be a lot shorter and a lot more direct. And we'll sort of knock this trust out. And I think you'll see how this goes. Um, but that's all we have the time for today. Um, just pay attention to uh, the Teams chat. I'll send an email with the um, uh, with the uh, 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 recording for our, our pre-recorded lecture. I'll see you all on Monday. You all have a wonderful. See you then.